Hi friends, uh, Ray Galea here, one of the pastors of Fellowship Dubai. We're starting a new series called, have started actually a new series called Origins. We're looking at Genesis 1 to 12. Uh, we're going back to the beginning. The word origins uh, or the word Genesis actually means origins or beginnings. And we're going to the very beginning of everything, the absolute beginning of the universe of time and matter. We're going to the beginning of work and uh, 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 relationships, sexuality, gender, the very meaning and purpose of life itself, even values like equality. They're all grounded in those 813 words that we find in Genesis 1, or at least in the English translation. So few words saying so much profundity and profoundness and profoundly simple all at the same time. Uh, we won't have the opportunity to delve into every rabbit hole when it comes to thinking through these questions. And there are so many uh, pathways to explore and questions that are, are begged by the very texts of Genesis 1 to 12. But today it's Genesis 1. And uh, to help me in that, we're going to have a conversation with David Hagar. Hey, David. Hi. Hi. Good, good to have you with us, brother. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Now, David, uh, how long have you been coming to Fellowship Dubai for? Oh, I'm in my 12th year now. 12th year? Yes. You're, you're married to a staff worker, Michelle. Yes. Uh, who we're so thankful for. Now, you're a f I got you here because, <clears throat> apart from being a nice guy, uh, you're a physics teacher, right? That's correct, yes. Okay, so you teach uh, high school physics? I teach high school physics um, up to university entrance level. Wow, physics. You know, I started three weeks of physics and knew that was three weeks too long and moved to the humanities and, and did the histories. And unfortunately, I stayed with chemistry and paid the price for that in my final year exams. But nevertheless, I've actually developed a love for science more post-school. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you're here because, you know, people often think it's science versus Genesis 1 and creation. Yeah. But of course, it's not like that, is it? Uh, the the two are overlapping, distinct but overlapping realities and and truths. Uh, so I guess uh, let's let's ponder a couple of questions as we think through. Sure. As I think through Genesis one, one of the issues is there there are firstly just different views on how you read Genesis one. Can you just kind of remind me again as to what the the different approaches are like? Sure. Um, you know I think we have to start off with the basis that the, the different views that I'm going to be thinking about are all Christian views. And so um, each of these views looks at the Bible as God's um, inerrant word. And within, you know, I've read a book recently where they've kind of categorized the, the thinking of origins and the thinking of Genesis into these four views. But even within there, there's lots of range of, of opinions. Yeah. So the first view really is um, what one could call the young earth view looking at the uh, Genesis text, literally um, six 24-hour days. Um, and uh, the second view, uh, one could call the old earth view, sometimes called uh, uh, progressive uh, Christianity, thinking uh, through the Genesis text um, as um, the earth having a much longer time period than uh, being created in six days, and the earth been much older than 6,000 years. The third view, I suppose, could be uh, looked at as evolutionary creationism, uh, where um, the essence of uh, evolution in science is um, really taken on board um, and believed and also has uh, very much an old earth viewpoint. Uh, the fourth one really is thinking about intelligent design, uh, which kind of stands apart from the other three, um, but um, is very much um, you know, in, uh, an authority in terms of thinking about, about origins. Um, now, there's another way to look at these. You know, if you think about science and you divide science into two broad areas, the physical sciences, thinking about physics, chemistry, like you mentioned earlier, yeah. geology and astronomy, uh, the general uh, consensus amongst uh, scientists in those areas is agreement on the age of the universe being around about 13.8 billion years old, and the age of the Earth being around about 4.5 billion years old. The second area of science we can think about is the life sciences, biology and medicine. And once again, the general consensus uh, in that area of science uh, is the uh, common ancestry of life. Now, when we think about these four different areas, their views of those two areas of science becomes very important. Um, if we think about the young Earth perspective, um, they kind of reject both of those areas. 
you know, the physical sciences and the life sciences view of um, the age of the Earth and the universe and the, and the ancestry of life. The um, old Earth uh, creationists tend to accept the physical science idea of the age of the Earth and the universe, but not so much the life science idea of common ancestry. The uh, evolutionary creationists uh, accept both of those views, and the intelligent design kind of stands apart from both of those. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's just stop for a moment. I mean, there are Christians who hold one or, or a version of one of those four views. Correct. Um, but for you, when you look at the, the world through your physics eyes, where do you kind of see the fingerprints of God? Um, uh, you know, the, the wonder of creation. What, what is it about creation that tells you, yeah, this couldn't have been, just been made uh, without the divine hand of God yeah. at, at every step? You know, I was, I was struck the other day. I was looking at some images that uh, NASA's put up from the International Space Station, just looking at the Earth and how thin the layer of the atmosphere is mm. around this planet which we call home which is keeping us alive. Yeah. Uh, and to me, that's just absolutely amazing. And also the knowledge that where the Earth is placed, um, you know, in science, we kind of call it the Goldilocks zone, yeah. the correct distance from the sun to support life as we know it. You know, um, things like that really uh, makes me think about uh, both the wonder of, the, of creation, but yeah. also the wonder of our creator. You know, as, as uh, physicists, we kind of look f at the very small, and at the very big, and everything in yeah. between. The microscope and the telescope. Or no, no, the yeah. subatomic level. Exactly, okay. yes. Yeah, even smaller than, yeah. you know, than the microscope. And uh, I'll give you two examples. So, uh, you know, when we look at subatomic particles, when we're looking at uh, quantum, uh, the quantum world, which is only around about 100 years old in yeah, terms of our reason, understanding, exactly. Um, you know, the fact that the atom, the subatomic particles are held together by a force that, at certain distances is attractive, but at a certain distance is repulsive, and how this all fits together, you know, we've kind of discovered it recently, but it's always been in existence. Mm. Uh, that to me is, is amazing. And then we look at the very big. And you're um, saying, and if it's slightly different from that, it could support life. Correct. Yeah. Correct. You know, and then we look at the very big, you know, we look at uh, the world of astronomy, um, uh, I'm sure many of the listeners would have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, mm -hmm. uh, which has now been supplanted by exactly by by a newer telescope. But years ago, they did what was called the Hubble Deep Field, and basically they looked at uh, a dark area of the night sky where there was no stars, mm -hmm. and they left the telescope. Um, they looked at an area. If you think about a tennis ball held about 100 meters away, it was that kind of size that they looked at. And they kept the telescope open for 10 days um, just to let light flow in. Once they developed the images that they collected and they composed it, they saw billions of galaxies mm -hmm. in this dark space. Oh. Um, you know, and th that to me is just um, absolutely amazing. The things that are out there that we haven't yet seen, mm -hmm. but yet are there as we speak today. You know, uh, when you talked about the Goldilocks thing, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Yes. Um, uh, I remember reading that actually in Richard Dawkins' book, um, you know, when he's arguing the case for yes. no God. Yes. And he just listed the Goldilocks theme. That is, if the earth was too close to the sun, it'd burn up. Yep. Too far away, any further away, we'd freeze. Yep. Uh, it's got one moon. We've got one moon, not multiple moons, mm -hmm. which means our, uh, our tidal patterns, they're just Correct. much yes. more predictable. Yep. Uh, we've got, is it Neptune or Pluto? It's Neptune um, that kind of takes passing asteroids and deflects them away from the Earth. Mm -hmm. And thinking, my goodness, it's so finely tuned. Yes. You think, this is too ordered. And then yes. and then you look at the rest of the universe, and as far as we know, the known universe is dead. Yeah. You know, there's not even, what gets me is there's not even sort of micro life on any of the planets that we know. Yes. Is that right? The right well, word? Well, as far as we can see yeah. currently, yeah. but. It, you know, for me, one of the exciting things is, you know, the further we see, the more we learn and the more we discover. Yeah. You know, the whole realm of, of exoplanets um, where uh, some of them are in the Goldilocks zone, Goldilocks zone of their particular star, yeah. um, you know, that, that's just, it just keeps fascinating me. Mm. But 
But as far as we know, is it right to say there is no other life in any other Correct. planet yes. at any level? Correct. It's yes. absolutely dead. Yes. Dead as a doornail. Correct. Yes. Okay. That makes, and you can tell even when you look at our galaxy, the blue planet of the earth just stands yes. out. It is just vibrant with life. Yes. And uh, houses humanity, which in Genesis 1, you know, we're told we're the pinnacle of creation mm -hmm. within the ordered, within, within God's plan. Yeah. Let's, let's think about that. We're made in God's image, eh? What are the implications of being made in God's image? Like if that, you know, where Christianity, Judo-Christian tradition is the only one that stamps humans with this title. Yeah. Do you reckon what's at stake if, if that wasn't the case and we were just part of the rest of creation? What would, can you think of any implications for that? Well, I think we would be a hopeless people. Yeah. Nothing, nothing to hope for because it would be like going into a, clocking in, doing your job, clocking out. Yeah. That would be our life. Yeah. We would clock in, just go through the mundane and clock out. There would be nothing really to aspire to, to live for uh, in terms of relationships, mm. what would be the purpose and the point, um, you know, in terms of uh, doing this or, or inputting into people's lives or trying to achieve something, what would really be the point? Right. It's yeah. a kind of a come from nothing, I end up as nothing, I am Correct. nothing. Correct. You yes. know, remember Jeffrey Dahmer was a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And he said at the end of his life, just before he, I think they might have been executed, uh, he said that if if the evolutionary worldview is true, and I've just kind of spewed out of history, uh, out of, you know, a, 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 a process that has no hand of God in it, then I have no moral reason to not give expression to that instinct to kill. Yeah. He said, because yeah. there is no right and wrong. Yes. If there's no personal God who has created humans, made in the image of God, and that you have no value, I have no value, and my commitment to you is a real, as, as real as my commitment to that table in front of me, yeah. then he said, it's just all about preferences. And he said, there's just nothing within me to resist that instinct to kill people. Mm -hmm. But if there is a God, he has made us in his image. And we are accountable to someone that all of a sudden I've got a worldview that gives me purpose, meaning, yes. gives you value, gives me value, gives everyone else value. Correct. And it's interesting that, I mean, the laws of, you know, the, the lands are all based on Judeo-Christian kind of principles. Yeah. Um, and we are uh, you know, required by law to live by those laws. Mm -hmm. But yet, on the other hand, um, there is this viewpoint that everything is just, you know, material. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, uh, when I read Genesis 1, the thing that was surprised me is how structured it is. Uh, you know, we know about the seven-day pattern in there. But what I didn't realize until recently is that, like, verse 1 has seven words. Mm -hmm. Verse 2 has 14 words. Verse 3, verse of 30, they're all units of seven, and seven being the perfect number. You think, when God said it is good, he's actually built within the very structure of this schema to explain creation in a very tight you know, semi-poetic, you know, I mean, poetry can mean different things, but it, even the very structure of it is telling us this is a very good creation. Yeah. Um, and so when we're wrestling with suffering that's about to happen in Genesis 3, that's not how he made the world. How important is it that the world started, for you, started good? Yeah. I think having um, having a, a good starting point um gives me a sense of um, hope, number one, um, that in the midst of bad or darkness, good can still prevail. Mm. Um, and I think that overriding idea that God started the world good means that we can always go back to that point yeah. um, in terms of we've gone down the line, but you know there is a perfect start that we can kind of rewind back um, and, and go back to. And I think that's where... Uh, you know, the, the, the actual essence of God wanting a relationship with us and wanting to repair that good through Jesus Christ yeah. becomes important yeah. to me. God made it, we broke it, Jesus fixed it. Correct, yes. And, and that God's good purposes, uh, God's original purposes were good. Yeah. He is good. We're the ones who mucked it up, but he didn't give up on us. Yeah. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. And, and for that. And the beauty I'm of thinking. that is, even though we mucked it up, there's nothing we can do to fix it. Yeah. 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 He did it at the cross. Correct. Yeah. David, uh, just tell me a little bit more personally about you. You know what I mean? Have you, as you started, started the, 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 
the being a science teacher, you're getting information and you're trying to process that, all your scientific data. You're trying to process it as you're reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, just explain. Uh, I found this very helpful when someone said, so, the job of science is to give natural explanations for the natural world. Uh, the Bible gives the ultimate explanations or the supernatural explanations. And so I think we shared before this interview how, you know, Jesus will say, not a sparrow will fall to the ground apart from the will of my father in heaven. That's the ultimate explanation. Yeah. But a scientist could explain it just as easy with an infection in the bird that killed the bird that caused the bird to drop off the perch and, and to die. And both statements are actually, both descriptions are true. Yeah. And, uh, and so you're, as a scientist, you're reading your Bible, you're doing the science project, you know, you're, you're studying the latest thing from NASA. How are you processing that as you go along? So I start from the point of that they're not in opposition to each other. Right. And I think, um, a lot of people see science and see the Bible, um, as opposing opposites. Yeah. Um, but for me, my starting point is that they are very much uh, working together, looking at different different aspects. Mm. Um, I found a, a saying by John Stott where he was talking about the Genesis account, actually, uh, referring to the account not being unscientific, but being non-scientific. And there is a distinction between the two. Um, you know, the Bible is, you know, or that account is speaking about um, God's relationship and God's purpose um, for creation. Um, so, as I said earlier, my, my viewpoint is to take the two together and see how they how they work with each other, mm -hmm. rather than starting off from the position that the one is right and the other one is wrong. Um, and I think that's that comes from the viewpoint that um, I was a Christian before I was a science teacher, um, and so my life is steeped in God's word. Um, and the science, which I really enjoy, obviously as a teacher, um, I enjoy looking at science. I look, like, enjoy looking at the world through scientific eyes and I don't see any opposition to it. You know, the other thing is that many scientists of the past were Christians yeah. and their purpose in looking at the world was to, um, investigate and, and, and discover but they looked at it through Christian eyes. And so this modern idea that science and Christianity are always polar opposites, um, I don't necessarily subscribe is it, to. Is it Robert Boyle? Robert Boyle was one yeah, of them, yeah. yes. So he, he explicitly said, I want to know how the world works so I can glorify God mm -hmm. uh, in that. I always love that. Yeah. yeah. Look, they reckon the reason why modern science came out since, what, the 16th, 17th century, that journey over the last 500 years was actually grounded in a Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. I mean, Correct. Uh, what I didn't realize is that if you if you see it, if you think there's a spirit in a tree determining the tree and you can't diagnose a break because you live in fear of that tree, you can't assess it, you it, it creates fear. But once you understand God created the universe and creation is not the same as the creator mm -hmm. and he's an ordered God who has given an ordered world that you can actually examine, study, name, dissect, all of a sudden the framework for science is there. And then the command to go and subdue the earth and uh, and understand it uh, and name it and so forth, it seems to me has given the framework for us to actually do the science project. Yes. Rather than set Christianity against science, they're actually working together. And what, in fact, science is dependent on the Christian worldview to actually unleash itself and do its beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think some of the dangers that we have today is that um, people don't, you know, based based clearly on what you said earlier that, you know, you didn't enjoy physics and you did chemistry and <laughs> that was a mistake as well. I think. Um, well, for me anyway. <laughs> yes, but but there is a fear of engaging with science. Yeah. Um, and so because uh, people don't engage with science, uh, there is this lack of understanding, and then a fear develops from that. Um, and I think that that is is uh, can be quite widespread and common in the church as well, um, and and so therefore there's this kind of difference of view between 
between the two. Now, David, do you think that's got to do with science teachers not making it fun enough and clear enough and simple enough? I don't want to name <laughs> names here, but uh, we've all had those bad teachers in our lives. To be fair, though, that's in every it's in everything. I, and, I would say in every subject, teacher. you get good teachers and exactly. bad teachers. Exactly. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Did you have a good teacher in your life that really opened up a desire for science, or were you just built that way? You no, know, I think I think I was built that way, even. You know, right. before I reached high school and, and really did science in, in the true sense. Okay. Uh, I remember uh, doing Bible studies um, when I was a teen, young teen, um, and asking questions. At the time, I didn't know they were scientific questions, um, which couldn't really be answered to my um, satisfaction. Mm. And, you know, and so I had these niggling questions that were always there. Mm. You know. Okay. David Hager, thank you so much for coming. Uh, friends, we just uh, want to use this as a base to start thinking through questions that spin off from Genesis, and they'll be different every week. And uh, uh, so uh, stay tuned because uh, through the course of this Genesis series each week, and you can get us, uh, you can get the message on YouTube and uh, our podcast if you've missed the previous Sunday's message. But we just want to just keep thinking through and just getting better at keeping the conversation going. Uh, so we can take the word of God into the week and just think through issues. Uh, and today it was on science and Christianity. But as the weeks unfold, we'll be covering lots of different topics. So God bless. Have a great week and I uh, look forward to seeing you next week.